Hi everyone, uh, Combinatorics of Process, lecture number five. Uh, today there is a small surprise. Uh, uh, the lecture will be given by Tom Trotter. If you learned one thing from this course, you should know that Tom is overqualified to do the job. Uh, so, thanks Tom for joining us today. Uh, the floor is yours. So in uh, 2021, 2021, I celebrated uh, a small anniversary, 50 years of working on POSETs. Uh, there's no one in this room who is old enough to appreciate it. <laughs> no one. I went to a conference in 1971, and I had just met Paul Erdős. Uh, there at this conference, I met Ron Graham, uh, William Tut, uh, Ray Fulkerson, Marshall Hall, giants, all of whom, by the way, are now dead. Uh, and perhaps I was not too long away from that, uh, that green pasture in the sky myself. But the love affair with POSETS is longstanding, and in my uh, professional life, it's been a giant circle, and the circle spins, and I go off and I do some geometry or some Ramsey theory or online algorithms or something, and then the, the circle keeps spinning and it keeps coming back to, to POSETS. And uh, that's where I started, and, and now that's where I'm really, really, really focusing. So uh, and my goal here is to teach you some things, to expose you to some things, and frankly, to entice you into thinking about some things. And I, I hope I succeed in, in all three of these. Uh, okay, a reminder of what Piotrick has been talking to you about. You have a family of Linear extensions, and notice I didn't say linear extensions, I just said linear orders, on the ground set of a post set. And you want to know for a distinct pair, x, y, distinct, Gwen, distinct, you want to define a query string. And the query string is you look at the linear orders and you decide whether x is less than y or not, and you make a zero, one string in the obvious way. It's one if x is less than y, and it's an ordered pair. So there's clearly what you mean is, is clear about the first one versus the second one. So you just make this query string. And then the whole idea about the original Dush McMiller notion of dimension is that these linear orders form a realizer if when you have a distinct pair x, y, they're comparable if and only if the query string is all ones. Trivial, just absolutely trivial. Oh, and by the way, now the linear orders become linear extensions. Now, the original notion of dimension is that it's just the minimum size of one of these realizers. Now, why do I like this subject? Uh, I think there's some beautiful, beautiful results out there. And this is one, it, Walter Snyder proved in 1989 that a graph is planar, if and only if you form a poset consisting of the vertices and edges, order by inclusion, and the dimension of that's at most three. And you're thinking, well, who would care about such a result? Well, this was the first proof that you can take a planar graph and lay it out on a grid where it's O of N by N. So you want to place the points of the graph at integer coordinate values, and then you want to have straight line segments, and then you don't cross. 
So Schneider was the first one to prove that you can do this. Now, there, there are other proofs since then, but this was the first. And it's a beautiful application of the theory. If you don't know this proof, uh, you should learn it. It's, it's really gorgeous. A quite recent result of Scott and Woods, and I've stated it in all of its technical glory. <laughs> if you have a POSET in which each point is comparable with at most k others, then the dimension is at most some constant times a k log k term. Now, you've got to focus on that k log k in the middle. And then there's an e to the 2 square root log log k. Okay, but e to the square root log log k is little o of the log. So this is actually constant times k log to the 1 plus little o 1 k. The lower bound is k log k. So this problem has been around for 30 years. The first proof of the upper bound on the form k log squared k was due to Furedi and Kahn, and they used the local lemma. So this is one of the first applications of the Logos local lemma to the world of postcides. This proof by Scott and Wood uses an iterated, iterated version of the local lemma. And I talked to Lotsi Lovos about this and asked him, I mean, did you do this? Have anybody done this before? And he said no. He thought this was an incredibly novel proof. With Erdős, to whom I owe, I owe a lot, he was a tremendous influence on, on me. I met him when I was 26. Uh, I, the Hungarian community in general uh, had uh, quite a profound influence on me. So with Erdős, Kirsten, and Kirsten, we proved in 92 that there's a constant so that if you take a poset that has n elements here, n elements here, and then put in the comparabilities random. Flip a coin, independently at random. Then the expected value of the dimension of this is at least n minus constant n over log n. Now the surprise here is the form of that lower bound. Because all you get from counting is n over log n. So for you random graph experts, Think about how it works with Greek number and chromatic number for random graphs. So if you take this simple case, random, with probability one half. You do the simple calculation, and then you do the tight computation, and all it does is show you that your simple calculation was correct. And this is absolutely not the case here. The bound is much higher, much higher than you would expect. All right, we've talked about in this series the notion of a large standard example, and a standard example being a trivial bound that forcing up the dimension. So if you have a large standard example inside a poset, you get large dimension. But Bjorfrey gave you several examples to show that you don't need a large standard example to have large dimension. Now here's a result that we have with Biro, Hamburger, and Poor. And you have to try to understand what this is saying. So the standard examples show that the dimension can be as large as half the number of points. And actually, that's tight. It's not only tight, it's achieved only by the standard example. Now, that's a very, very non-trivial proof. It would take more than a week to, to prove that theorem alone. But this says that that theorem is stable in the sense that if your dimension is about half the number of points, close to it, then the only way that that can happen is that it's driven up by a large standard example. And this is, very, I, I like this proof very, very much. A uh, comment on the function f of c. From below, using the, again using the local m, although you can get there with concentration results from probabilistic method. 
f of c is at least of the form c to the 3 halves. But from above, the existence shows you one which is omega of big O of c squared. So there's an interesting open problem about what is the right answer to this uh, thing involving the behavior of this function f of c. Both proofs, upper and lower bound, are, are, are quite nice. Quite nice. So if someone asked me, why do you care about this subject? Why, why are you like, well, you know, I just point to results like this and say, read the proofs. If you read these proofs and think about it, you will fall in love with the subject too. You can't help it. Now, here's the first of uh, two major conjectures. Among post sets with planar cover graphs, large dimension requires a large standard example. And uh, some conjectures, you, you can date them right there and say, okay, here's the first time it appeared in print. This one's a little vague because I know from notes that I have that this goes back more than a decade before it appeared in print. And the reason that nothing was happening with it is because nobody had any idea how to attack it. So you, know, you don't make yourself look like an idiot by, by bragging about what you can't do. And not only you can't do it, you don't have any idea how to begin. So it just kind of laid there for a while. All right, so that's first major conjecture. Solve that and uh, I will treat you to a nice dinner, a case of wine, uh, you know, solve that. That, that, that would make, you know, actually, I would probably cry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, why does somebody study dimension other than sheer beauty. And I, I'm a mathematician. I'm, I'm, I'm not even a, an applied mathematician. I'm just a mathematician. So I don't really need an explanation for what I do. I do it for a sense of values which is thousands of years old. But there are people who try to justify this and say, look, if you have a class of post-sets on which dimension is small, then you get an efficient data representation. So you take the linear orders and you want to know whether x is less than y, you just check their positions and if you only have a little bit to, to check, then you've got a fast answer to that. I mean, the throwback is to put, you know, put a 0, 1 matrix in by n matrix and say, put a 1 where to say that x is less than y. Okay, but that's, you know, Computer scientists hate the stuff like that because that's n squared. You want you want something much smaller. Okay, if the dimension is ten, then you've got ten linear extensions and you can test it. But all these classes are showing up where the dimension is really very large. Even just a complete bipartite of the fact like this, where you just put the edges in, the dimension is almost n. In you know, n minus constant n over log n. So forget that. You're not, you're not going to gain much from that approach. But if that's the end goal, if the end goal is to be efficient with the representation of a post head, then maybe you got the wrong definition. So wouldn't it be enough if I could make up some linear orders so that given a pair x, y, I can tell whether x is less than y just on the basis of the query string. Just give me the bit string. And based on that, I look at nothing else, no other side questions. Just on that query string, I say either yes, it's true, or no, it's not true. Okay, so now you have a definition, and this is due to Nesitril and Pudlak originally. Nesitril told me about this a couple of years before this and tried to get me interested in it, but I had no feel for it. Uh, and yeah, so I didn't think much about it. The Boolean dimension of a post set, B dim, 
is the least t so that there's a sequence of linear orders and you can partition the bit springs as two parts, the yes part and the no part. And the partition and the linear orders has to have the property that if you give me a distinct pair x, y, and you give me the query string for this pair, x is less than y if and only if its bit string, its query string, is in the yes pile. It's that simple. Okay, you can formalize this and say, I'm talking about a Boolean formula, stuff like that, but it's just some queries are yes and some queries are no. In the Dushnik Miller sense, there's one query, one query that's yes. And then you pause and you say, well, you know, what you could do with Dushnik Miller is you could turn some of those linear orders upside down. Now they're not linear extensions anymore. And then you just toggle your one single acceptable query and you have no change. It's the same subject. You're just not working with linear extensions anymore. Okay, but in Boolean dimension, you can use anything you can get your hands on, any linear order whatsoever. The, the cleverness is in two parts. First, how do you make up the linear orders? And second, how do you split the query strings into the yes category and the no category? Trivial, the Boolean dimension of a post set never exceeds its ordinary dimension because you always have the opportunity to just take linear extensions and take yes is all ones and anything else is no. Question? Uh, I don't quite understand what is the query string. Okay, so here's a linear order, here's a linear order, here's a linear order, here's a linear order. Now here's a pair of elements x, y. It comes as an order pair, so there's the first one and the second one. There's a first one and a second one. Okay. So now look at the first linear order and tell me the order in this. Is it x less than y? If it is, your first bit is one. Otherwise, it's a zero. It's simply recording the order between x and y in each of the linear orders. So all ones means x is under y every time. Any quick am I clear now and what is the query string? Good. Okay, thanks. It's like T equals D. Pardon? Does T equal D? Well T and D they sound about the same. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a that's an interesting logical uh, conundrum, isn't it? So th this way, the Boolean dimension, everything is always one. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, thank you for pointing out that. All right, so now let's begin to get our hands dirty and, and actually find the Boolean dimension of some objects. So in this course, you've learned about the standard example. So. So D elements on bottom, D elements on top, and your comparabilities are a complete bipartite but minus the matching. So AI is incomparable with BI. And the ordinary dimension of this is D for all D greater than or equal to two. But now let's make up a Boolean realizer which is much smaller. Let's make up one of size four. So here's the idea. You take your first linear order and you're going to put A under B. Let's just do it in the natural way. A1 up to AD and B1 up to BD. 
Now, let's do L2 and just turn these guys upside down. Okay, so now, thinking ahead, you're going to give me a query. Turn them upside down in a second. Thank you. So I want the two, I want the A's under the B's in both of them, but I want to turn the A's over and turn the B's over. All right, so now, if you give me two A's in the query, then I'm going to get opposite bits on these first two. Same thing for two B's. But if you give me an A and a B, then I'll get one one. If you give me a B and an A, I'll get zero zero. But then let's take L3 and L4 and do this. We'll put A1 over B1, then put A2 over B2. Keep this all the way up to AD over BD. And now we're going to sort of dualize this. All the way up to A1 over Say that again. I think you want to just uh, exchange the places of A I B I. Just put them as I want the A I over the B I twice. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. So now let's just pause and let's see if you're thinking ahead. I'm claiming that these four linear orders, with an appropriate choice for the partition, yes, no, verifies that the standard example has Boolean dimension at most four. Who can tell me what's yes and what's no? What should yes be? So think of an AI BJ. What kind of pattern are you going to see for an AI BJ? You're going to see one, one. Now what will you see here? Depends on the value of I and J. If the I is less than J, you'll see one, zero. And if it's the other way around, you'll see zero, one. Okay, but at least that tells me that I need in my yes category to have one, one, zero, one, and one, 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 zero. And then you just think about it for a bit and you say, that's it. Make all the others no. So this is this goes back to Nessie Troll and put like so I, you know, they, they wouldn't brag about this, but it's a useful observation and it helped to motivate them. Let's take a new parameter, which is arguably small, on something which used to be big. Okay. So in the remainder of our time together. I'm going to give you some exercises. I don't know how many of them the organizers, the, the real bosses here, are going to use, but show that this is tight when D is at least four, but it's not tight when D is three or two. Okay, it, 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 it's, yeah, it's not. It's the, the, only, the only stickler here is that D equals three, because you can do one better when D is three and showing you can't do any better when D is at least four. Is the exercise clear? All right, among post sets with endpoints, there are some that have large Boolean dimension, at least some constant times log n. 
So b Boolean dimension doesn't stay tiny all the time. It does grow with, with some post -sense. All right, let's do that. So the idea is that you're going to work with we're going to work with labeled posets. So we're going to put symbols on them, and if the symbols aren't in the same places, there it's a different poset. And the class that I'm going to look at is a, again my kind of complete bipartite thing. So let's put uh, n over 2 on the bottom and n over 2 on the top. These are labeled. So you've got all the different ways to do that. But then it's all possible ways to put in comparabilities. So apart from the labeling, you still have 2 to the n squared over 4 posets. That's a lot of posets. All right, now I'm going to make up a Boolean realizer. So what do I get to do? I get to make up L1 up to LD. But each one of those is a linear order on a ground set of size n. So being generous and ignoring the order, how many different ways can you do this? It's n factorial, but you've got n factorial choices for each d, for each i. So that's the way you can make up that. But then you get a choice for your yes, no. So what's the, what is it? It's a partition into two parts of a set of size two to the d. There's two to the d queries. And so how many ways can you do that? <coughs> that's two to the two to the d. So that product has to be big enough to cover all of these. Just Okay, now when you have a product like this, and you're saying it's greater than or equal to that, just using the trivial explanation, one of those factors has to be at least the square root of that. So if I take n factorial to the d being greater than or equal to 2 to the n squared over what was it? It was 4, so the square root would put an 8. All right, you know, n factorial is essentially n to the n d, you know, ignore the e. You don't keep terms around that you don't like. And then n to the n d is it? Yeah, two to the d log n. Two, okay, now, I mean, so now you've got cancel it in, and this is going to give you that the d has to be at least like n over log n. Yeah, ignoring your constants, n over log. Okay, but now the other one is two to the two d has to be at least two to the n squared over. Okay, now this one taking two of the d's I can so so this is like d is like log n. So this is the better this is the, the more restrictive bound a, a least restrictive bound. So if you make d around log n, then you get your desired angle. But you can't go lower. So this is showing that. Among posets with endpoints, there's some that have Boolean dimension, a constant times log n. Not not a very satisfying result. Oh, by the way, among ordinary dimension, you can use the same result. But back to my first comment: if you do this on that family, you get d is omega of n over log n. And if you were paying really close attention when I mentioned that result with Erdős and Kirstead, 
It was on that model, and we said almost surely the dimension is n minus n over log n. So n over log n is a garbage lower bound. Garbage. Okay, well, that's a garbage bound again because this one is the controlling one, and it says that the Boolean dimension is at least log n. And uh, this, is, this result is due to Nesitrol and, and Pudlak, and they also showed that it's optimal, up to the multiplicative constant. So you, don't, you, you need a lot of points to get big Boolean dimension. Here's another nice one. The Boolean dimension of the subset lattice, <coughs> all the subsets of an n element set ordered by inclusion, is again n over log n. It's going to be something similar to, to that calculation. Uh, you know it's at, at most n, because the ordinary dimension is n. But it's saying it can't fall away too far. It can't fall below n over log n. Let's do that proof. And this uh, observation is due to uh, Fussner and Isak, right? This is a, it's a very cute observation. So we're talking about the subset lattice. And somebody says, well, it has small Boolean dimension. And then you say, all right, show me the L's. And in these L's, I want to find the singletons. So just look at the N singletons. They appear in some order in this L1. They appear in some order in L2. They appear, etc. Now, not in the same position, not in the same order. But something like this. There's n of them. OK, now take your favorite set. Take a set A, which cardinality of A is at least 2. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to locate A in every one of these L's. So it's, it's somewhere, it's somewhere, it's somewhere. It's somewhere, there's no, there is no restriction because these are linear orders. I don't know a priori the location of the A relative to the singletons. It's just not respecting inclusion or any such thing like system. So what I want to do is talk about the signature of A. And what I'll do is record the gaps. So there's a gap at the bottom. There's a gap, there's a gap, there's a gap, there's a gap, gap. So there's n elements that are n plus 1 gaps. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to record the gap of A in the first linear order. Which gap is it in? And then gap 2 up to gap D. I, I don't care what the elements themselves are. I don't care which elements are there. I just care about which gap it goes in. OK, is this definition clear? How many singletons are before A? Yeah. 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 How, many are, how many are under? Was, it, was his comment clear? He's just counting the number of singletons that are under A. Okay, so now the claim is that if you have A and B, the signature of A is different from the signature of B when A is different. Now, I'm going to walk from here to there and back, and then when I get back, you're going to tell me why. Pressure is on. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Okay, who can explain it to me? <laughs> you don't count. Okay, Neon. Now maybe we should let our visitors. You, you're you're a local expert. Okay. So the dissonations are the same. Then A and B or that we have the same respect to the singletons. Yes. So pick up any singleton, any singleton, and look at the query string for that singleton versus set A, and that singleton versus set B. You will get the same answer. So you get the same answer for every singleton. That can't be when you have two distinct sets. Because you don't know whether it's going to be yes or no, but it doesn't matter. They can't agree on every singleton. It's not simple. Okay. And now, a little counting. How many sets are there that have at least two elements, two to the n minus uh, n plus one. And now, how many signatures are there? n plus one, n plus one gaps to the dth power. So n plus one to the dth power has to be at least two to the n minus the quantity n plus one. And that gives you n over log n ignoring constant. So here's going to be the second exercise. Take the post set of one element and k element subsets of one to n. That's the post set in some places denoted P1KN. And when people are talking about the dimension or the Boolean dimension of this animal, they drop the reference to the P and just put the dim on the outside. So here. I, I'm talking about the Boolean dimension of that post set, suppressing the, the P notation. So remember how this behaves for ordinary dimension. Even for the case K equals 2, which is the incidence post set of a complete graph, this goes to infinity like log log n. Slowly, and by the way, for fixed K, anything, it still goes to infinity, eh, sort of like a log log n. But the, out in front, you have a, a term which is growing with k. So it's, it's going to f infinity slowly in, for fixed k and for all n. But now, the exercise is to say, well, it doesn't matter what the value of n is, the Boolean dimension never <coughs> exceeds 2k. So the first part of the exercise will be to show that it doesn't exceed 2K. And the second part, which would challenge you a little bit more, is to show that when K is fixed and N is suitably large, this type becomes absolutely tight. And, and this idea right here is your hint. You need a notion of a signature, except you won't be using singleton, you'll be using something else. But it's the, there's an idea in there. And the germ of the idea is what you're supposed to exploit in the exercise. Okay. Among the interval orders, there are posets with large Boolean dimension. Okay, now. Among the interval orders, there are posets with large dimension. Okay, but this is saying much more. It's saying the Boolean dimension is large. So standard examples have Boolean dimension four. So it's somewhat remarkable that your dimension is large. Okay, so let's, let's do this one. So we're going to use this so-called canonical interval order.
So you have the integers from 1 to n. And then you have all the intervals with integer endpoints. So you want to show that when n goes to infinity, the Boolean dimension of this grows with it. So suppose that someone says, no, it doesn't. It stops at some d. So I don't care what the value of n is, I'll give you a Boolean realizer where the number of linear orders is only d. So we're trying to disprove that. So here's what we do. This is an application of Ramsey. So we look at the three element sets I, J, K. So you're seeing as a subset the three element set I, J, K, but those three elements determine two intervals from your interval order, the interval i j and the interval j k. So in these L's, if I look at any one of the L's, then I look at i j, it's in there somewhere, and there's j k somewhere. But I'm just talking about a query string. So you're looking at two different elements, the element interval ij and the interval jk, and I want to form the query string. The query string is a bit string, so there's two to the d possibilities. But for the query string of the pair ij, jk. But d is fixed. So 2 to the d is fixed. So I'm coloring the three element subsets of 1 to n with a bounded number of colors. Ramsey's theorem tells us that if n is large, you can get a homogeneous or monochromatic subset of any size you want. Any size you want. Hmm. So I've got one to n, and it's enormous. But I want a homogeneous a monochromatic subset. And I want one which is not too long. I want one like this. So what are we saying? Take, take any three element subset of this Look at the intervals, and they go to the same query string. And how many three element subsets are there? Okay, I, in my early combinatorics days, we worked this out, and there are four of them. But I don't care about all four, I care about two of them. I care about this three element set and this three element set. Now, look at one of your Li's. Uh, bad, bad notation. Look at L alpha. Take one of your L's and look at this relation, Ij and Jk. Now, I don't know what order it's in. So maybe it's in this order. Ij is under Jk. But if you look at JK with KL, those three element sets are going to the same query string. So I know that the order between IJ and JK is exactly the same as between JK and KL. So the KL is up here. And that argument is completely doable. 
if this pair were turned over, then this pair would be turned over as well. Okay, I'm walking. You've got about 20 seconds to tell me what the problem is. <coughs> All right, who's, who can tell me what the problem is? The query string for the IJ and AL will be the same, but uh, that pair will be comparable and the previous ones were not. Did you hear the explanation? It was spot on. So what would be the query string for the interval IJ versus KL, it's the same. And now you have a contradiction because your queries are supposed to tell you who's comparable, and now you're blending comparable with incomparable. Now, in one of the talks, Piotr made a point about splits. Splits are incredibly useful. They, they, they appear in, I don't know, 15 or 20 different papers on post sets and dimension. And everybody knows what a split is? You have an element, and now you split it, and you, you take a guy up here and a guy down there. And by the way, you can leave the post set in place if you want. You can just add, you know, here's the post set. You can just add a guy up here and a guy down there. I call them dingle and a dangle. Just leave the post set there. Okay, now, when you make that change, the dimension goes up by at most one, but it definitely goes up. Okay, now, if you take the post set away and leave the dingles and dangles there, that's what people call the split. Now you've got height two, and again, relative to the original post set, the dimension has gone not down, can't go down, but if it's moved, it's moved by only one. By the way, just curious, what happens if you split the split? And split the split, and you split, and just keep on splitting. Okay, it can go up by one, and maybe later it goes up by another one, and then two weeks later it goes up by another one. Maybe, maybe just slowly, or, or maybe one after one, one after another, it goes to, just keeps on growing, right? Now, if you want a challenging exercise, prove that it grows at most twice. Doesn't matter how many times you use, but I didn't list that one. <coughs> that, one's, that one's a little tough. But if you're stuck on it, uh, the expert in the room is Bartek Volzak, and he can explain to you why. Yeah, so this, this one is not, a, not an exercise. This one, this one takes some, some work. Okay. Now, this should come as no surprise after having done that. That's as funny as I get at my age. <laughs> <laughs> so I made up these slides last night, early this morning. So I, 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 I there's an error here or there. This, this line shouldn't be there. Okay. Now here's an exercise that I don't think you'll find totally trivial. So what's it say? It's, but it'll be fine. This will, these others are pretty easy. This one will take a little time. Here's the idea. I have a post head and it has maximal elements. And now, here are the non-maximal elements. But this post set, this sub-post set, has a certain width to it. 
So there is a size of a maximum anti-chain here, and that's size W. So now you use Dilworth's theorem on this body. So you can cover the bottom with W chains. C1, C2, up to CW. Now, for every I, I want you to form not a, not a linear order, not only a linear extension. Take that chain, CI, and push it up. Push everything else down relative to the chain. You can do that. Dilworth thought that was so obvious, he made it as a one sentence remark, as a footnote of his classic chain partition paper, the 1950 paper. The dimension of a post set, in the sense of Bush McMiller, doesn't exceed its width. He thought it was so obvious that he didn't write down a proof. But Dilworth was like that. As many of you know, there's a dual form of Dilworth's theory. The post set of height h can be partitioned into h antigens. Of course, Dilworth knew that. But he did not feel that it was worth writing down a proof. So he never did. 21 years later, someone else did. So depending on which books you look in, uh, this uh, dual form will be credited to someone else. And to his dying day, Dilworth always chafed it. He thought that was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, all right. So is it clear what I'm doing? For i equals 1 to w, you force that chain up and everybody else goes underneath it. Now, there's one thing left to do. You've got to keep the maximal elements up and you've got to kill them. So do what you like on the bottom, just any linear extension. Take the maximal elements and look at any one of the linear extensions you've built thus far, find its order. Now take that one and turn it upside down. So what have you done? You've got W plus one linear extensions, and that's a realizer. So in that setting, the dimension is at most W plus one. So the Boolean dimension is down here. <coughs> okay, so I just did the first part. Okay, the challenge is to show that you can squeeze that one up to that one, taking the one in the middle with it. So that you can make it tight. Now, that will keep you busy for you know, five minutes. I, I won't attempt to walk to the door and back and someone explain to me the proof I've done. Is, is the exercise clear? Yeah. So in the paper that actually appeared in 1989, it's from a conference of 1986, and these ideas are even older than that. Nesitil and Pudlak actually, they just asked the question. They didn't make it a formal conjecture. The, the, the belief in this has uh, come from other people over the years. Is there a constant C? So if you have a post-set with a planar cover graph, then the Boolean dimension is at most C. And I should say that the original conjecture was not for posets with planar cover graphs. It was for posets with planar diagrams. And so over the years, we've strengthened the conjecture because we can't touch the original one. So if you can't do that one, why don't you make it harder? So uh, I've known Piotrick for almost 10 years now, and I've, I've had strong ties with uh, Jagiellonian University and, and a group here for many years, and I, I've been a frequent visitor here. But sometime in 2021, uh, Piotrick said to me, there's a, a scholarship program run by our 
Polish National Academy, why don't you ap apply for it? And I said, well, you know, they're, they're not going to give a scholarship to an old guy like me. You know, these are for young people. And, and he said, I've checked. There's no age restriction. <laughs> I, you know, I thought, yeah, so I have to say, the, the hardest question uh, to answer on the application form is, what will this do in terms of your career development? <laughs> You know, I've been retired now for for some years, and there are no more promotions, and there are no more this or that. So, so my answer was absolutely nothing. <laughs> but just perhaps, I, I being there, I, I can interact with people, and, and I just might have some my presence and interaction with them might might be a benefit to them. So anyway, I applied for this with Piotrick's uh, help, and I got it. So I'm a, a, a scholarship holder from Nava. And the principal theme that we wrote in this proposal was to attack these two conjectures for the class of posets with plane of cover graphs. The Boolean dimension is bounded, and the ordinary, the Josh McMiller dimension is bounded in terms of the standard example number. So in a moment, I'll tell you just a little bit of what we've been able to do. But I started off by, by saying, I, I've been doing this for 50 years. But it's just incredibly exciting to be around a group of people where new ideas and new things uh, happen. Now, as things would happen, yesterday afternoon at 4 o'clock, I was in the room with Gwen, Mihai, Bartek, and Piotr. And they were just rambling on about some beautiful notion of clique width, clique width, and it's possible application, in fact, it's more than possible, they have an application, to bounding dimension in terms of standard example number. For a class, and it, 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 this includes some of these topological results. And I was just blown away by the conversation and just excited to be in the room. I, I understood like 10% of what was being said, but uh, I'm old, but I, I can still learn, and, and so I, I, I commit to you guys. I, I'm going to learn this stuff, and it's, 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 it's very exciting what, what you're doing. That's really cool. So it's, and it's all, double the age of any of them, and you, you won't reach mine. So they're all young guys. Cool. OK. So with Misek, Heather Smith Blake, here's what we've been able to do. For the class of posets, okay, we're cleaner cover graphs, but now I need an extra crutch. I need them to have a unique minimal element. So it's not the whole class, it's a it's a subclass. Uh, so first thing we've been able to do is we've been able to prove that the dimension is at most twice the standard example number plus two. Now, uh, some notes about this. Some of you may have heard a talk by me, by, by, by others, because this result is actually three years old, but it had a weaker bound. We had a quadratic bound. So the, re the major advance of the last couple of months is the reduction in the quadratic bound to a linear bound. Now, earlier, uh, Piotr mentioned this and said that the two was best possible. And I had a proof of that, but my proof was wrong. And so this two uh, is, we only know that this is best possible up to a multiplicative factor of two, because we have the wheels in the Kelly example underneath, uh, we have the wheel underneath giving you a multiple factor of one. So there's still uh, some room to work on. Uh, this proof, I, I, I just think it's really good, you know. So when I, yeah, I'm, I'm not a religious person, but if someone ever calls me before them and say, what have you ever done that's nice? I say, oh, read this proof. Uh, this, I, I like this very much. And, 
we can show that the Boolean dimension in this class is bounded by 13. Uh, those of you who, who know some of this work, it used to be 22. So we, we've gotten a little better. So we tighten it up, tighten it up. But it's not going to go much lower. So if somebody can say, oh, well, it's actually five, uh, that would be exciting. Okay, and you, you're not going to go below that because of the standard examples. So it's been a real treat for me to be here with you. and. Uh, I could stand up here and talk for more, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to just stop and we'll go to an early lunch or something. Thank you.